Thank you for that slow clap. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the third talk in our series, Talking Music in Maine, an Intimate Conversation. Um, first, uh, let's give a round of applause to our sponsor, Horch Roofing. Thank you very much for sponsoring this wonderful evening. And also to the Lincoln Theater uh, for sponsoring and hosting this wonderful <laughs> evening as well. Our genius in the uh, lighting booth who put all of this wonderful evening together that you'll see on the screen and listen to it as well. Damon Libert there up in the uh, balcony as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> My name is Aaron Robinson. I'll be your host for this evening. And uh, it has been wonderful to be backstage for the half hour as you have been filtering into your seats, talking with uh, one of my musical heroes. Uh, the first two guests that I had in this series um, were for the audience, but this evening is for me entirely uh, because I have been listening to his music ever since the early 90s. Uh, I will talk about the tape that I have behind me, uh, but the very first cassette that I bought of Paul's, I wore that out. It actually snapped in my cassette player because I listened to it so much. I have been a fan of his music um, and it has been an absolute joy to know more about his life and uh, we will share that this evening. Um, and if you are a fan of Paul Sullivan, uh, you are in for a treat as well. So uh, I will not talk anymore, but I will welcome our guest for the evening, <coughs> Paul Sullivan. <coughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, we could we have go. kept talking backstage, I think, all evening. We definitely could have. But this is the first time you and I have actually spoken. It is. Yeah. First time we've ever met. Yeah. Well, except for a half hour ago. Right. And uh, we, we found quite a lot of similarities in our philosophy and our music and our... Yeah. So many that it was completely impossible that we hadn't met and been friends for... 30, 40 years, I know, it was almost we've been sort of doing the same things. Like a musical brother from another mother. <laughs> exactly. Da right down to the blue right shirt and, the, and, uh, and the khaki <laughs> pants. I mean... <laughs> I think Jill called my wife and said, what is he wearing tonight? <laughs> Two guys with one idea. That's right. Well, thank you so much for being here this thank evening. You. And, thank uh, you. And this is going to be a treat for me and I know for everyone out there. Uh, you ready? You want to get started? I am so ready. Very okay. glad to be here. And I just, I do want to thank all of you for showing up and I want to thank you Aaron for inviting me this is really an honor and uh, you know I hope in the next hour or so putting a spotlight on my life uh, is worth it I mean you know uh, it's well everybody's got an interesting life without exception and, and I feel very honored that you all would gather around to hear some stuff about my life great so I appreciate it well many of you know Paul as a pianist of course because uh, some of his very first recordings were, of course, piano, solo piano. Um, but m what many of you might not know is that Paul is a multifaceted artist, musical artist. He's not only just a pianist, uh, but he is a composer, a conductor, a writer, and a teacher. And we will hopefully get to all of those points this evening. But let's start at the very beginning. All right. A very good place to start. <laughs> Thank you for that, Paul. Yes. Okay, so growing up in Boston, uh, your first professional music training began in the fifth grade when you went to school in Cambridge, Mass., which was a choir school, That's right. which was St. Paul's. St. Paul's Choir School. That was not named after you. It was not. No. However... Not then, not now. <laughs> you were there when it was founded. Yeah, the... Uh, it was an interesting place because it was a Catholic uh, parish school, but then uh, a, an extraordinary choir conductor named uh, Theodore Marier, he, uh, he proposed to this Catholic school that he could do uh, an additional curriculum and fold in a choir school into the school itself. So we had, you know, it was all the same building, we were all in the same classes, but the choir boys <clears throat> were gathered from all over the city. I came from Dorchester, so I had like a, you know, a 35, 40 minute subway ride every day to work, 
to school. And, but I'd get, we'd get there at seven in the morning and sing a mass, usually in Latin, and then eight o'clock would be school time and we'd be in with everybody else until 11 o'clock and then there'd be a, a music class for us, you know, some kind of music theory or something like that. And then we'd stay for <clears throat> an hour after school every day for another rehearsal. And then uh, Friday nights we'd come back for a rehearsal and Sunday was a big, uh, uh, high mass. So there was a lot of music wow. superimposed on the regular school. It was, it was amazing. Now, Theodore Maria was a, uh, <clears throat> an incredible scholar in Gregorian yeah, chant. He was. Just incredible. He was. And, and we, we learned Gregorian chant. I mean, that was right from the start. We learned <clears throat> that and we sang it every day in church. And uh, I mean, literally every day. And, uh, I remember one time he, he published a hymn book and the hymn book had at the back of it many, many pages of Gregorian chant. And for those of you who may have forgotten what your Gregorian chant looks like, it's the, the note heads are squares and there are only four lines. And, but they do have dots and they do have some connecting lines between the note heads. Anyway, uh, on page you know 322, there was a a dot that was incorrect, a dotted note that was incorrect. And we, he would not have it. And I, we were, we all got little razor blades and we, <laughs> <clears throat> all the choir boys, and we ended up in the church at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, turning to page and scraping out that little dot. I mean, he was that, he was that. Uh, meticulous. <laughs> meticulous is the word. <clears throat> That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that till just now, but I do remember it so well. Well, in, in the fifth grade, uh, f f being under the tutelage of someone um, with that scholar, scholar, scholarly uh, education, were any seeds laid at that early age? Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> very much so. I, I, well, it was the first time I had ever been around professional musicians. My, mm. my family, my parents uh, loved music and were very supportive, but they didn't know a thing about it. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, we, people who know me just snickered in the audience. I because, heard a snickering. Yes, I, I because it was, the same, know why. it was the same way with mine. It was really? the same way with mine. But, like uh, all yeah. for it, but we can't really yes, help Yes, I off. always say, and I jokingly say this, it, it was the famous James Whale line that um, my parents were farmers and they were given a giraffe, and the only <laughs> thing they knew what to do was hook it up to a plow. So God bless them. <laughs> I came out of nowhere as well. So. <laughs> that's, that's a good image. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, St. Paul's, I, 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 I met on a daily basis with... Uh, not only Theodore Mario, but his, his assistants. People who were professional, you know, who knew the answers to all my questions. And not only that, but uh, showed me all kinds of things I had never thought about. And I, I felt so well met for the first time. It was really, really, really great. <clears throat> I felt in good hands. Well, uh, the next question, of course, is what you always get uh, coming from our generation. Um, and you usually get these either going for a job interview or you get them at a cocktail party uh, just before you perform or after you perform um, because it usually makes the person asking it feel important, which is where did you <laughs> study and be? who did you study with? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, Paul, after, after school, where did you go to college? I went, well, after St. Paul's, <clears throat> I had another paving stone put down in front of my foot just as I needed to step in the form of uh, a recruiter from Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire <clears throat> who was going around Boston looking for musicians to come to Exeter. And they found me because I was at St. Paul's, which was a music hub. And they came and interviewed kids and because my no one I knew had ever heard of Phillips Exeter Academy. <clears throat> uh, just didn't know a thing about it, but these people came along and, and told me all about it. And anyway, I, that's where I went. They gave me a, I got a 
scholarship and had scholarship jobs, but I was there for four years and I studied with uh, the, the music, the, the piano teacher there, whose name was Klaus Goetze. Uh, he was very, very good. He was <clears throat> very, very German and uh, very knowledgeable about what he did. And I was, uh, yeah, I, I was deeply engrossed. I mean, I kind of lived in the music building there. <clears throat> From there you went to? To Yale. To Yale. And uh, there, at Yale, I didn't, I didn't take piano lessons. I, I did a couple of times from a guy, Bruce Simons. Do you remember that name, Bruce Simons? Anyway, he, he was a wonderful piano teacher at Yale, but I didn't really take regular lessons. I took a couple of lessons. I studied music very, very, very intensively, uh, composition and music history and theory and all that. And then <clears throat> my junior year, I was lying on my bed, as was my custom, and I, uh, <clears throat> I was looking up at the ceiling and I thought, you know, after next year, my meal card is gonna expire and this bed will no longer be available to me and what am I gonna do? And it, that's not how I usually think. Uh, usually I just sort of, uh, oh, what just happened? But I was uh, thinking ahead and I thought, well, what am I, what am I gonna do? And I knew that I was going to be a musician. That had long since been clear to me. But, and I knew I'd be a piano player, but I also knew by then that I was not going to be making my living playing Rachmaninoff Concerti uh, with the world's orchestras because by then, age 20, I would have been doing that for five or six years already. You know if that's gonna to happen to you. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, how could I make a living playing piano? And I thought, well, maybe I should learn something about jazz. So it was then that I went to uh, a, a teacher at Yale, uh, one of my music teachers named Maury Yeston. And Maury <clears throat> was uh, wonderful. He had this great kind of father-like arms around you. He had a, a coterie of people, of students that he just cared about. And he welcomed me into it. And he was very knowledgeable about jazz. And he introduced me to the jazzers on campus, of whom there were zillions that I didn't know. And they took me in for my senior year. I was in the jazz band. And, and I got an education. You know, they, they told me who Charlie Parker was, who Duke Ellington was. I mean, I knew nothing. Mm. And uh, that's how that was launched. And then it turns out that Maury wrote several musicals. He wrote the musical Nine, which debuted on Broadway two years after I graduated. And we can get to that later, we'll but that, that, that later. was the entree <laughs> to the Broadway world as well. Right. Right. While at Yale, is it true that you uh, studied electronic music? Yeah. And then taught a course at Yale? I did. Afterwards? Yeah, after I had graduated, I went back up to do a, uh, <clears throat> a seminar. I mean, it was a for credit thing, mm -hmm. but they have, you know, it was an independent seminar. They get professionals from various fields to come up and do a a semester course. And so I did one on electronic music and used the electronic music lab there. I, I love electronic music. Yeah. There are incredible archives of Milton Babbitt at Yale of all yeah. of his music as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Princeton. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, you know, the resource at, the resources at any place like that. Had you ever thought at any moment or, of going into that or, or, or dabbling in that? Or oh. did you think that had already been saturated by the, no, the you greats? Know, I, uh, no, I, I wasn't really that attracted to electron. What I liked, I remember this distinctly. The first synthesizer I ever played I, <clears throat> was a ARP. And I was so thrilled because I could get it, I could, I could by turning a knob, I could raise, I could get between the keys of the keyboard. I could, you know, bend the notes. And I remember figuring out how I could make it sound a little bit like a South Indian flute. Mm. And to me, that was a great, because I just happened to love South Indian music. And, uh, but anyway, so I was never interested in rigorous academic electronic music, yeah. a la Babbitt. 
Right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so after college, you head to um, uh, New York after a brief stint playing jazz in New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. And you play in jazz clubs in New York. Yeah. Uh, in the world of jazz, you have played with <clears throat> the greats. Benny Goodman. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Flanagan, who uh, is a great jazz pianist, right. or was a great jazz pianist yep, and composer. Really a great one. Uh, Red Mitchell, great bass player. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou Donaldson, alto saxophonist, who, by the way, is still with us at oh, 91. Yeah. Um, and you were even a guest uh, on Marion McPartland's Piano Jazz. I was. Yeah. With That was in later years. That was probably in the 2000s. Right. But uh, that was with Paul Winter. Both of us were guests. And I got, uh, you know, I got to do my duet with Marianne and yeah. hang out, and that was a, that was a high water mark for me. Right. You know, when you you go in the studio that she uses used, <clears throat> uh, there was that famous portrait of the Harlem Renaissance art, on the art on Canes, the Browns, 1958, a great day in Harlem. Right. Right, exactly. She's standing next to uh, Mary and Lou Williams. Yeah. Right. Right. And when I, oh, and there she is. Yeah. When I saw her in that, in that galaxy of yeah. superstars, I mean, I, I knew who she was before I went in there, and when I saw her, diminutive as she is, I, uh, you know, she was, uh, uh, she had a little aura around her you know, just for her, uh, her career. But then I saw that her in that picture, I thought, oh my God, she really, that is the real thing. She's one of how many white people? In She'd the already world? made it at that time in 58. Yeah, she yeah. was only one of two women. And the only, the other white people were Jean Krupa and Pee Wee Herman, uh, Pee, Pee Wee Herman, Pee Wee, um, <laughs> uh, what was his name? He did 12th Street Rag. Uh, uh, Pee Wee, no, yes. Pee Wee Hunt. Pee Wee Hunt. Uh, could be. Yeah, but she was the only white woman in that entire... Yeah. Oh, it was... In, in Harlem. It was She'd heady already, company. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so she only had to say, yeah, well, this is a picture of me, mm. so deal with that. Right. <laughs> Let's see a picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Um, so in New York, I, I, I've got to ask, there's a lot of things that you've done, and we'll get on to that, but um, what's up with the Rockettes? Oh, <laughs> That was really cool. Uh, I had written a lot of music for dance companies, and in particular, one dance company, Palabalus Dance right. Company. <clears throat> and they, uh, I was sort of their composer in residence, although that was never an official term, but I just did all the music that they needed. for Some 20 for, scores. Yeah. And they were approached by the Rockettes <clears throat> to participate in a program that was really great. It was called Rockettes Out of Line. And the, the basic premise of it was that the, the dancers of the Rockettes are incredibly good dancers. Uh, that should come as a surprise to nobody. I mean, they, they, it is not a sort of glamour contest. I mean, these women are real artists and real disciplined, experienced dancers. And the idea was to get other choreographers to, to come in and choreograph works for the Rockettes, not for their Christmas show, not for their commercial stuff, but they, they were going to, the, the idea was to do a uh, touring program of the Rockettes doing all kinds of choreography, you know, to show off their, their tremendous skill and to show off the originality of other choreographers. So it was a great idea. And Palabalus was contacted to <clears throat> do the choreography of a piece. And I went down to New York with Allison Chase, who was the woman from Palabalus, one of the founders. And uh, we did this. We rehearsed every day with the Rockettes. Not, not all, no, not by any means all. Maybe 10, or 10 of them, 15. However many we wanted. But, uh, and they were the greatest. They were so eager so grateful for a chance to do something other than high kicks right. <laughs> that, and they were incredible. I mean, the Palabla's style of dancing was, is 
you, you know, especially then, it was less known. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's a lot of body-on-body -body counter leverage and people standing on shoulders. And uh, it's, it's not just steps. And these women just, you know, I mean, Allison would barely have finished doing it once. And then they'd all just do it perfectly. So it was thrilling. And anyway, I'm not going to keep these stories so long. But what <laughs> happened was, this was horrible. We were all, we all loved it. We couldn't wait to come back from lunch, all of us. The dancers, me, I would sit there and improvise stuff and then, you know, kind of sketch it out during lunch and try it in the afternoon. And it was heavenly work situation. <clears throat> Such positivity in the room. And so at one point I said, so when are we doing this anyway? When do we show this? You know, when's the first performance? Oh, well, we have to have, we have to get it approved by the, the executives who own the company, that own the company that owned Rockefeller Center. And so, I mean, this sounds kind of silly, but we had this demonstration for these guys, and they were all guys. And it was up in a room in Rockefeller Center, I mean, at, at Radio City Music Hall, you know, a rehearsal room on one of the upper floors. <clears throat> And we had this great thing, and we all knew it was great. And all of a sudden, in come, we are, and we're all set to do it, and in come the judges, these guys. And they were all these suits, and they were <laughs> these master of the universe 30-year-olds who clearly didn't know a thing about dance, but they, they were all about branding, and, and uh, they kind of sat there, and looked at it, and uh, then they just walked away. And we found out a few weeks later that not only our piece, but the entire program had been canceled. Oh. It was just a kind of a, no, I don't think so. Oh. And they were the ones who, it just was so, uh, so wrong. Yeah. You know, I, anyway. I love when corporate decides art. Well, that's what this was, yeah. and it was my first experience with it, and I was appalled. Mm. I mean, I don't go in there and tell them how to make their deals. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, Rockefeller and Diego. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> but it's my wall. Right, it's my wall. <laughs> oh, gee, wow. <laughs> that's exactly the, 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 it's exactly the analogy, so, good for you. Aaron. while in uh, New York, <clears throat> on and off Broadway as a pianist and conductor for various musical. And is this true? I'm going to show you a face because I, I couldn't believe it when I read it. But of course, you know, when you read something on the internet, right. it might not be true. Oh, <laughs> did you do a cabaret with Louis Black? I did. How, how do you do a cabaret with, and you, <laughs> with hands like pancakes? How do you do a cabaret with Louis Black? You know, that, I can't believe you found that. Well, he's my favorite comedian. Really? Yes. He, it was a, a that is just, <laughs> you really do pull him out. Yeah, Louis Black, uh, he, we had this, it was really like bohemian heaven. We had this cabaret on 42nd Street. It was upstairs. I don't know what they're, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but it was a, uh, you know, it was a dedicated cabaret room on a second floor over a, uh, I forget what it was, even downstairs, a restaurant, I assume. But it was a true hangout. And it was a, and Lewis was one of the hangar routers. And <laughs> this wonderful actor named Joe Grafazzi and, and, uh, Anyway, there was a whole group of, of people, and Lewis was one of them. And we did these cabarets. It was, uh, you know, they were very late night. You know, it wasn't as though that was the cabaret I did with Lewis Black. It no, was no, like, no, I understand. You yeah. know, he'd do something, right. and uh, other people would do something. And it was, it was, as I say, it was bohemian heaven, because it was all pretty high-class stuff. But, right. But... Nobody was into it for being high class. It was just funny. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, and also while you're there, thank you. For you have um, you've sat in for as pianist and conductor for some heavy hitting musicals. We've got Cats. We we've yep. got Chorus Line. You told a very funny story about Chorus Look. Line up in the green room. <laughs> Rags, which is a fabulous, fabulous musical. Ten years before Ragtime, but the score is just one of my top favorites. I absolutely love that by Charlie Strauss. Yeah. Um, and absolute, Murray Eston is one of my favorite uh, composers that is really unrecognized. Grand uh -huh. Hotel, yeah. and of course, Nine. Yes. Rao Julia, Nine. Look at you. One of, one of the <laughs> most beautiful ballads, I think, in all of Broadway is um, in an unusual way. Oh yeah. In Just gorgeous, just gorgeous. But you knew Murray, from yep. your college days. Yep, and then from working on Nine, right from right. the beginning of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and worked on it for three years. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was at the starting gate on that one. Right. And that was a really interesting experience to watch a, what eventually turned into a Tony Award-winning Best Musical of the Year musical start from just sitting around with Maury and a couple of singers mm. and him tossing ideas around. You know, I, I, was, I was the accompanist, I was his... <clears throat> well, it was interesting. I was gonna say I was sort of his amanuensis, but I wasn't because he, like he would, uh, Tommy Toon eventually was the director of it and Tommy would say, Maury, we need a uh, couple of more bars of that vamp just to get so-and-so off the stage. And, uh, you know, I would have been sitting there playing the vamp, and so it wasn't too hard to, and Maury would yank down the music off my stand, and he would write, he, I said, Maury, I can do that. I, you know, I said, no, no, no. He insisted on writing every single note that was in that score. Right. Because he didn't want, not that he was afraid of me, but he didn't want any confusion. Mm -hmm. You know, that every time the pencil went to the paper, it was his pencil right. and his paper. Right. So that nobody, because, let me tell you this, uh, if you don't mind this story. <clears throat> That's why we're here. I, I know, but I can't, <laughs> you know, I seriously, I'm still trying to get used to the idea that you are here listening to all this stuff, but uh, I, I had a roommate in New York City. His name was Mark O'Donnell. And Mark O'Donnell was a playwright and an excellent one. He's gone now. But he wrote the musical Hairspray. And he wrote it over years. He, John Waters was the, was the Mark adapted it to a screen, to a, a theater. Uh, and he, wasn't, he was one of two guys who did it. But anyway, he was the principal guy who wrote the book, wrote the script of the musical Hairspray. And uh, at their opening, well, I should maybe not even name this guy's name, but one of the actors, they had, a, they had their initial reading in preparation for the, they now had all the money, it was gonna be a Broadway show. So they had the initial reading, and the initial reading is a very serious, almost kind of solemn event because you are now, for the first time, anyone has ever heard the, the lines, the voices, the songs in the air uh, for the first time. It's no longer just on paper or an occasional someone reciting lines. So now you're finally getting it in a slightly 3D fashion. And, every, and it's a, as I say, it's, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot, of, a lot on the line. The actors are all meeting each other for the first time. They wanna be good. Everyone wants it to be good, and everyone is nervous for his or her part in making it good. So they had a, an actor whose name everyone here would know, and he was, he, he was only had a, a cameo bit role. It was like a little couple of one-liner funny things. And during the read-through, he kept on interrupting the script and like telling a joke or saying, hey, 
Yeah, that's easy for you to say, sister. <laughs> Things like this. And, uh, and it was scandalous. You just don't, no matter who you are. And he kept on going. And uh, yeah, that reminds me of the time. And uh, afterwards, my friend Mark was almost in tears. You know, he'd worked so hard on literally every single syllable of this thing. And here's this guy. So he goes, Mark goes the next day to the producer's office. And the, there's this classic sort of, I don't think she had a beehive, but she had the big glass of, she was the receptionist and guard dog of the, rece of the <laughs> producer's office. And, but Mark knew her and she liked him very much because Mark was his complete sweetheart. And he went to her first and said, yeah, could I talk to the producer? Hey, he's not here, what do you need? And he said, well, you know, something horrible happened yesterday at the read there. Oh, yeah, I heard. And uh, he says, well, you know, I, I want to talk to the producer. I, we, this, we can't have this. And she said, you know, she said, honey, get with the program. This is Broadway. <laughs> she said, you want to know something that you're, not, you're really not going to like? <laughs> not only did he, is he going to get away with having disrupted the whole uh, read through, his agent was on the phone at seven o'clock this morning with the producer demanding that he get writing credit <laughs> because of how much he had added to the script yeah. and that he get star credit because he had such a lot, uh, he was never told he had this kind of a speaking role. Yikes, <laughs> yeah. And he got both those things. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a sleazy old world out there. Anyway, I don't know where we got onto that uh, sidetrack. When we're off mic, you can tell the name. Yeah. Jolson used to do that all the time, Al Jolson. Do what? Uh, Bogart a when he used to, show? When he used to be given a song, he would change one word so that his name could go on the t front cover. That, See, that and that, I think, yeah. is what Maury knew about. Yeah. That's why Maury, you know, no one touches that just, paper. Just one word. But Maury. So he could get writing yeah. credit for the lyrics. Yeah. They're out there. They're out there. They're out there, those so, people. Speaking, oy, oy, oy. Speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of musicals, um, who is Charlie Scott? Charlie Scott is, was the last ferryman to drive the ferry between uh, Sedgwick, Maine and Deer Isle, Maine it is across Egamogan Reach. And uh, he's, we, he's been commemorated in a musical called The Last Ferryman. Which and he wrote. was the real guy. His, fa his family had, had created that ferry and run it for 100 years. And he, Charlie, ran it for the last, until the last, he, he ran the ferry as the bridge was being built. He ran it almost underneath the bridge. And then the bridge was dedicated in 1937, governor, marching bands and everything. And Charlie, who just lived in a cottage up the up the reach, just up the shoreline, little ways, uh, watched from his window, didn't come to it, and was dead in a week mm. or so, 10 days, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the musical was commissioned uh, by the Opera House Arts uh, at the Stonington Opera House, and it celebrated, uh, celebrates the 75th anniversary <clears throat> of opening the Deer Isle Bridge, which you just said, which towers nearly a hundred feet oh, yes. over the uh, Edgemogen Reach, which is the title track of your Sketches of Maine. Sketches of Maine right. Um, what a scholar. And, and you wrote both the lyrics and the music for this musical. Yeah. The, the entire score, right. lyrics, just like Murray. Just like Murray. Just yep. like Murray, right. Um, the Opera House, uh, Arts received several grants to produce this musical. In fact, uh, I think it was close to a hundred thousand to to do this. They were very serious. I think that's right. To do this musical. How do you do this? Aaron? And uh, <laughs> that's amazing. I, well, I don't know if it's boxes or briefs, so I haven't gone that far. Um, and I love, I love what executive producer, uh, director um, Linda Nelson said of creating this new work. And I love the community aspect. She said. If we don't invest in creating a new performance, are we going to do Les Mis all our life? I loved that line. Mm -hmm. And I don't know a community that would raise $100,000 to create a new work 
for their community. Yeah. What was it like to, to how, how long did it take you, first of all, uh, to write the score? How long were you invested in this project? Uh, I didn't have long to write it. Uh, things, I could let you all in on a secret. When artists are in charge of things, they don't always go on schedule. Uh, and this really went awry, through nobody in particular's fault, but I ended up having maybe four months to write the whole thing. <laughs> and it had to be We're gonna done. have dinner with my wife later. <laughs> We've got to talk. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I would not have preferred to have had four months. That right. was a rush job. Mm. But, you know, a deadline right. is a big motivator. Mm -hmm. So I did. I wrote the whole thing in, in about four, yeah, four months. But sometimes creativity, uh, I mean, you look down through history of music, um, 300, 600 years, but mostly about 300 years, some of the greatest works have been written in weeks' time. Oh, yeah. Uh, so once you're in that, that, that zen of right. creativity and it just flows, um, you, can, you can stay with the work for 10 years and force yourself and nothing comes. And then there's right. something else that just opens and you receive that channel and it, it just flows from you. Did, that is true. Although I didn't even, you know, with... with Sometimes that. you don't even remember writing some things that just flows so quick. Yeah, I, I, I was obsessed by it. Mm. I, I, I was thinking about it morning, noon, and night. Mm. But, but I... Uh, well, it just had to be done. It's funny. I really didn't even have time to think about whether I was... I just needed to write another song about this particular scene or something like that. You know, it was, and that's a great way to be, because I, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't fuss over every note. I couldn't, I couldn't get my razor blade out and extract one dot. <laughs> I had to just like go for it. And uh, I think, you know, there are, there are aspects of it that... that uh, we're hoping to have another production of it done. <clears throat> uh, I was going to ask, has this gone on? Well, did yeah. you, make, you made a CD of it. Made the CD. Mm -hmm. I, I did that out in L.A., uh, which was a, uh, quite an amazing experience. Uh, having gone from the community cast in uh, Stonington, all of whom were my beloved friends and neighbors, mm -hmm. to but but not necessarily the best of musicians, to going out to L.A. where I had two days with people I did not know, but who were the best of musicians. And they just came in and, oh, there's your musical. All right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is it. It's all done. <clears throat> uh, released in 2005, Silver Solstice? Yeah. Uh, was the 12th album by the Paul Winter Concert, Consort, sorry. A compilation two-disc album of the live 25th Winter Celebration, which included a guest uh, musicians who had collaborated with the Winter and the Consort, uh, with Winter and the Consort in the past. Uh, and this is where you received your Grammy. There it is. Yeah. Do you remember what you played for the compilation? Yeah, I mm. do. I, I, it was a song I wrote called The Rising Moon, mm -hmm. and, uh, but <clears throat> it, it was for being part of the band, you know, it was, it wasn't, I got my Tony for that, that the Grammy, uh, for that song, it was it, for right. that record. Right, yeah. And actually, here's a little bit of trivia that <clears throat> no one knows until right now, but the, the Grammy that I am ha holding there no longer exists, and the one that is on my shelf is the one that the guy to my left, Eugene, is holding. And how that happened was, not long after I got it, uh, my wife, Jill, was bringing it upon, she had been requested to bring it over to show it to somebody at their house, and she stumbled on our granite door rock, and, <gasps> and the thing, it's just so cheap, these Grammys. <laughs> You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> that ain't gold. I can tell you that. And it's so cheap that, that we said, oh, well, you know, we'll just glue that back together. Oh, no. 
And then we started taking it to professional glue backer togethers. And they said, there's nothing to attach anything to here. This is junk. <laughs> and uh, I called the Grammy. I had been told, you know, oh, if you lose it or anything like that, you just call up and they give you a new one. And uh, I called and said, oh, yes, oh, we'd be happy to replace that for you. Uh, it's, we have a fee of $950. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK, I'll get back to you. Anyway. I didn't have a Grammy for, you know, years. And uh, <clears throat> then the guy, is it on my right? Yeah, that guy, Eugene. It, he, he was over one time visiting me, he lives in Vermont, and he said, so where's your Grammy? I said, I don't have what I told him the story. He says, oh, well, I'll give you mine. And because uh, he has two or three other Grammys, so he, <laughs> He took, and he just, and all it said is Paul Winter Concert. It doesn't say Paul Sullivan. Right. Yeah. So he just said, here, take mine. So now I have his, and nobody's got mine, and we're all happy. <laughs> anyway. Is Jill not allowed to touch this one? Oh, she felt terrible, but I mean, what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> it was a, she was only doing it to support me, as she always does. Yeah, yeah my wife breaks things in our house, too. Okay, so you not only traveled with the Paul Winter Consort. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but you've traveled through Europe, yep. the Middle East, Central America, Asia, and even toured via the Trans-Siberian Railway. This is you here in um, Ekater Ekaterinburg. There you go, Russia in 2006. Ekaterinburg, Russia. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was quite a... The, the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway is, <clears throat> I learned, kind of a rite of passage for mm. many Russians. You know, you, you do it from Vladivostok to St. Petersburg. And everyone seems to have ridden it somewhat. It's, you know, it's a central, it's like Route 66 or something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but with Borscht. Oh, man, yeah. we had, I, I, I really, I could tell stories about everything. I, I don't want to be... Uh, talking too much, but that was quite an exotic tour. Uh, we got shaken down for money on the train by the police on board the train. I mean, but there were also great experiences. There, there was, uh, <laughs> anyway, I feel stories coming on. Let's, let's, what's well, next? Well, no, I was going to, uh, I was going to ask because that's Danger, danger, stories, that's, stories. That's, that's an extensive, <laughs> travel log, um, Europe, the Middle East, Central America, Asia, uh, the Trans-Siberian Railway, uh, but you do not and have not ever had an agent or a manager. No. You represent yourself. Yeah. And Jill has helped you. Jill has been. Has been. All, both of all, those Both things. of those. But yes. For your career. <clears throat> We've so done it how do mom you, and pop. How right. do you and how have you toured Europe, Middle East, Central America, Asia? Oh, 90% of that was with Paul Winter. Oh, Paul Winter. Yeah, yeah. I'd get a, I'd get a ticket and yeah. show up at the airport. I've done. I mean, I I did uh, some concerts in Japan, on my own. I've played in Europe, solo concerts of my own, mm -hmm. and around the U.S. But yeah, the Middle East, uh, definitely Russia was all Paul Winter. Yeah. Uh, so w without that. Um, you know, have you ever looked back and, and, and thought, well, you know, a lot of our colleagues, um, I'd never had an agent or a manager as well, have you ever looked back and thought um, what life would have been on the road all these years? You know, having to answer the agent's call, saying you're, you're going to have to be in Detroit on Monday, you're going to have to be in L.A. on Tuesday, oh, you're yeah. going to have to be in <clears throat> Connecticut on Wednesday, uh, you know, and living that life of a traveling musician. Yeah, I mean, well, to a certain extent, I, it was like that in that Paul's office would call and say, sure. you know, next week it's Amsterdam. But, uh, yeah, it was not as though I felt constricted. I would have hated that. And, yeah. you know, you and I were talking about that backstage. That we both, you and I are both uh, primarily independent musicians because we want to do and love to do and can do too many things to make, you know, an, an agent, uh, when I was younger, I, I used to always think, oh, 
you, you just have to be good enough and then you get an agent. Then you, but then you realize that you have to be clearly a source of income enough for an agent to like you. You know, the agents are, I mean, it seems so obvious to all of us now, but I thought it was sort of uh, your reward for practicing hard and, and being good. And, you know, it's, it's not about that. I, I didn't understand what agents did. Mm -hmm. But I've never been, you know, just ask Jill, who's been my agent. I've never been really a very lucrative uh, client for an agent. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't want to have been, you know. I, I, I did a lot, a lot of traveling, and I did love it, and I don't wish I were doing it now. Well, we also talked about uh, the fact that with your name, Paul Sullivan, uh, what that first impression usually evokes, which is a certain style and sound of piano uh, recordings. Mm -hmm. um, but when you really study your life, uh, you realize those layers start to unfold. Uh, and not only is your experience and your history uh, layered through all of the jazz and the Broadway and whatnot, even your discography is, does not stay in one place for very long. Right. Right. Uh, you started out with your sound, but you quickly go off into every different direction. And most uh, people who start off with their signature sound stay there because it seems to sell records. Uh, sometimes that, that flame burns hot and quickly, but it burns out. And then they, they, they worry in decades to come, how can I regain that yeah. hot flame? Um, but you have gone off in different directions. You did a 50s album. You did a, a, a gospel album with Teresa. Mm -hmm. um, you've done so many different styles. Uh, you, you've just started to tap into in 2009 with choral writing. Um, it seems as though that you've done works and, and music uh, for yourself first and brought others along for the ride. And, and I, would, I would ask this of you, uh, are you happy? Are you happier that way as a musician rather than having to, um, to appease to an audience first and... Oh, yeah. 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 I'm glad you didn't ask if I'm happy. Oh, that's way too complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> but yeah. as, as a, a musician, musician, as a as a musical path, absolutely. Yeah. I uh, I I have always been independent, and the reason is is because I am a staunch adherent to Duke Ellington's observation that there are just two kinds of music: good music and bad music. <laughs> and <clears throat> I have. I have had huge emotional responses to Gregorian chant, to Broadway shows, to the Allman Brothers, to Stevie Wonder, to Stravinsky, Chopin. I mean, I, I don't differentiate. You know, if something just moves you to the core, either makes you want to cry or makes you want to dance or makes you want to, you know, play air guitar. Uh, you're still just moved. And I've been so moved by so many kinds of music that I couldn't begin to think of, oh, I don't do that or I don't do this. Now, there's a downside to it, which is if you, bec if you want to be a Baroque oboist and there are such creatures, and I, I know one personally and love him. But if you want to become a Baroque oboist, you can't also play you know, some jazz gigs, and you do Baroque oboe. And so you drill down very deep. I mean, you know, people who, and so I don't, I have never gone that way. And, and I don't consider myself a jazz musician. I don't consider myself a classical musician. I don't know what I consider myself, and I mean that quite seriously. And I, uh, I, the reason I don't consider myself those things is that I have too much respect for people who have dedicated their musical lives to that. There are jazz people out there, I'm sure you know, who they just know everything there is to know about jazz, or so it seems. And classical players who 
can tell you, you know, I mean, Seiji Ozawa conducted the Boston Symphony in rehearsals, not just performances, but rehearsals from memory. Mm -hmm. So he could go, he'd be conducting, and then it'd say, French horns, measure eight to 120. Make that a, more of a sforzando. That is a classical musician in my estimation, and that ain't me. So, you know, in some ways, I've always been a man without a real tribe, mm. and I haven't wished I were part of a, any particular tribe because I, I'm too interested in what, what this other tribe is also doing. So I do some of that, and I am facile. I can pick stuff up fast and, and kind of uh, you know, slide in when they're calling the role for various tribes, you know, I can sort of get in there, at least temporarily. Right. And uh, I wouldn't change it because I, I feel so uh, rich in the palette I can draw from, and not at all limited. I, you know, I do these concerts at, with Jill and I uh, at our home, and they are all, uh, <laughs> there's our home. Yeah. When were you there? <laughs> well, let, let's get to that because in okay. 1990, 1998, you moved to Maine with your wife, Jill, your beautiful wife, Jill. Yep. You live in Brooklyn, Maine, not New York. Right. And why do you call your house the Palazzo? Well, we just moved into it a few years ago. We, heretofore, we lived, lived 30 years in a modest Maine farmhouse by the side of the road and loved it. And it was old, a couple of hundred years old. And... Jill uh, started getting into real estate and she came home several times and said, you know, there's this house, it's been on the market for years, nobody seems to like it, it's modern. And I remember, in fact, when it was being built and I thought, you know, could you have come up with an uglier house to be in this neighborhood? Seriously, I was, I hated it. And uh, now I live in it and it's the most beautiful house that was ever made. And. Uh, I call it the Palazzo just because it was built by uh, an Italian man and he had a lot of money and it's a very fancy, in some ways, very fancy and big house. And truthfully, I mean, we, we, have, we lived for 30 years on what money we could make from me playing the piano and selling CDs and that's all. So I don't need to tell you. We didn't have big money. This house was worth big money, but it had been on the market for six or seven years, and they just, the, the, the descendant of the guy just wanted it out of her life. She lived in California, had plenty of money, evidently, and so we just got this thing. But I call it the Palazzo because I, far from ever having lived in a place like this, now mind you, it's not, I sort of exaggerate, I have a big imagination. It is, if you were to see it, you wouldn't say, oh my God, is this Versailles? We're, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a nice house, but you've all, many of you probably live in houses as nice and all of you absolutely have friends. It's, it's not one of those houses, but for me it was because I don't come from that. I came from people who cleaned houses like that. So anyway, I, I call it the Palazzo and uh, we have these, I, this music series, Music at the Palazzo, and I, it's whenever I feel like it, which is great too, because I don't have deadlines except self-imposed ones, and I just invite various friends I've met and known, musician friends, over my career, and uh, they come up and play, and the, the, the reason I even brought this all up is that the music we play, I mean, we play classical music, we play medieval music, we play jazz, we improvise. It doesn't matter, you know, as long as it's good, hmm. it belongs. And I've had Brad Terry, your last guest, he's been up several times. He brings up his clarinet and the two of us just start to play. Uh, we've had whistlers, we've had Baroque sopranos from Yale, we've had everything in between. Uh, uh, it's a glorious, it's a glorious venue because it is a place where I don't have to convince any committees to let me <laughs> have a harmonica player come. You know, I just 
tell Jill we're going to have this harmonica player. Okay. And it works. So it's finally a place where I can have all my restless, crazy musical uh, loves and interests on one stage. Well, hopefully you can get the Rockettes up there sometime. <laughs> Let's Maybe two of them. Let's it's kind of small. Let's talk about your music for a little bit. Uh, you've written pieces uh, about spring peepers, fireflies. You've written a march for animals, a fandango for a hawk. You've written a tango to a squash, which I heard over at <laughs> Round Top in the 90s, and I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, Rain on the Lake is one of the most percussive uses of piano. It's marvelous. It's reminiscent of what Thelonious Monk used to experiment with. Killing Frost um, mm. has those exquisite chord progressions. It reminds me of uh, the Great Gate of Kiev or, or the transition of the third scherzo of Chopin where he goes from yes. the F sharp minor yep. into the D flat. Yep. Gorgeous. That's incredible, isn't it? That's oh, God, absolutely. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah. Your music is so incredibly image uh, inducing and thought provoking. You use the sounds of nature. Do you come up with the image and idea first or the overall sense and feel of the piece you know, are you inspired by nature? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, that's one of the main, <clears throat> uh, the most wonderful parts about living in Maine is that I get to be mm. surrounded closely by nature and with people who love nature and know it better than I do and by, obviously, by nature itself. And I, I uh, what I, what makes me go is sound. I just might. My ears are just, have thick cabling to whatever neural pathways. That, I live through my ears. My eyes, really not so much. I don't remember things. I don't, Is ears. that why you like Art Tatum? Yeah, you know, maybe why. Maybe. I mean, because was, you use so much uh, sound. You use seagulls, you use spring peepers, you right. use wind. You so use... I go around and collect that stuff. I mm. love just the sound of, uh, I mean, just this summer I was out on a, on a yacht, fancy yacht, a good friend of mine, and uh, rather than just sort of zooming along, I made him, I said, oh look, that's a bell buoy over there. He said, yeah. I said, well, we have to go over there. And uh, I made him circle around to create some waves so that the bell would start. And then I just recorded it. And he said, why are you doing that? I said, I really don't know, just because I, I have a collection of sounds. And so I would go and record seagulls, and I would record crickets, and I would record spring peepers, just because I just love to sit there and listen. And then I would, and I didn't say, oh, I'm going to write a piece about this, but like spring peepers that, that relentless, delicate tone, which has some pitches in it, sort of. I mean, I would just listen to it and just love listening to it. But then it, it would, then I would, I remember with Spring Peepers, I said, oh, you know, I, I could write a beautiful hymn-like piece and have this just be the descant, just floating above it like angels or something. And I, I remember the piece, because I said, I'm going to try to make this as simple as the slow movement of a Beethoven sonata, like the pathetique. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. And I just wanted it to be, to try to have that Beethoven, just a few notes that just get you, you know, no, no wasted notes, just these simple. So that was my, that's how that piece came about. And that's how most, I mean, like, Fireflies, I definitely, I was looking out the window, and I said, what would that, what would fireflies sound like if they were an oral thing, not a visual thing? Do you compose at the piano? Yeah, I do. You do? I do. Yeah. Mostly through improv first. Right. Which is a big no-no with classical composers. Well, Stravinsky composed at the piano. Well, he, uh, yeah, mm. but a lot, of, a lot of people you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I compose it. Would frown on it. No, I compose at the piano through well, improvisation. I, I think so the best of us do. I know, absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so in 2007, uh, you released your the album My Irish Soul, and um, that's not it. There we go. 
uh, which consists of traditional and Celtic <clears throat> folk tunes. Uh, was this a personal project for you? Because with the last name Sullivan, uh, do you come from Irish background? I mean, is there an O in there? Do you box? Just a little bit. Okay. No, in fact, <laughs> uh, this summer uh, I found out that my sisters gave me a DNA test. And our, my DNA on both sides goes back 10,000 years at least in Ireland. <laughs> wow. So, it's kind of boring. It's like 100% Irish. I was hoping, or I was expecting, as it often happens, you know, like, whoa, Romanian or yeah. Chinese. No, it's like just Irish. Straight through. Irish, 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 Irish. There you go. And a little more Irish. <laughs> yeah. This is a beautiful CD. You Thank you. You sent this to me when I sent you. Uh... Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I dedicated a song to you uh, on my Moments in Maine song because uh, just before I gave up concertizing, I would do something during my concerts where I would ask in the second half um, for money. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> where I would ask uh, people in the audience to shout out a composer and also shout out a piece of, uh, of uh, music or a hymn or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would improvise the composer. In that style. And, that, and it was at Christmas time and someone shouted out once in Royal David City. Mm -hmm. And surprising to me, Normally they say Chopin, Beethoven. Someone right. shouted out Paul Sullivan. Come on, who was that? I don't know who it was. Jill, were you there? <laughs> but so I improvised once in Royal David City, such as you, and that turned into the piece that, yes. that I sent to That's you so and dedicated incredibly. to you. But you sent this to me, and it was wonderful. That's so incredibly uh, flattering. In 2009, Blue Hill Performance, A Terrible Beauty, based on Peter Barron's famine novel, yep. The Law of Dreams with an incredible 14-year-old Rosie Upton singing. Uh, it premiered here in Maine, and then went on to New York at the Donaghy Theater at the Iris Art Center on West 51st Street in right. 2010. Right, uh, we're gonna 2010? Watch, we're gonna watch a little bit of it right now. Oh, cool. Okay? Mother and father, dead. Sisters, dead. You feel very light, floating, not much attaching you to the world, it seems. Fergus was on the point of opening his mouth and pleading with the landlord's son to take him back to take him home. Is courage just the awareness that gestures, journeys, lives have intrinsic shape and must one way or another be completed? And small who dwell in Ireland. Oh, I pray you pay attention whilst I my pen command. It was my father's anger that drove my love away, but I still have hopes we'll meet again in North America. So you wrote the music for A Terrible Beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly not that song. Yeah, right. North America, those are traditional. Yeah, yeah. And but the, you, the, the, the one that she sang at the beginning, of Spirit Seeking like Light and Beauty, that's one I learned at St. Paul's Choir School. Yeah. But I wrote all the But I mean, yeah, you the songs, did the music the, the for A Terrible Beauty. Yes, correct. Yeah, just Oh, it's wonderful. so great to, 
see that. And, and then you used Rosie Upton again for a, um, a Christmas CD. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, met her when, we, when she was 12. Mm -hmm. And I knew, well, you didn't, didn't take a genius to know that she had real, she had it yeah. big time. And so when she was 12, I used to uh, bring her all around Maine and do yeah. feature her in concerts, you know, my concerts, but I'd introduce her around and she was a complete show stealer every single time. I just, and, and she's, she's like my musical daughter. We're very close to her family. She's now living in New York City and uh, Broadway bound. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's, she came and played a concert at our house, sang a concert last year. Yeah, still a very good friend whom I am proud to know. Great. Now, your Christmas albums, um, your Christmas albums, next to folk art, which I talked about, this is, this is actually the, the cassette that I just played the hell out of. It's right this, out of the Smithsonian, this, that It thing. is. No, I just <laughs> loved this. Uh, it just is probably one of your, your best um, albums. You. And Christmas in Maine yeah. is probably your second. It's just fantastic. Uh, and, and I want to uh, talk about it just for a little bit because when you listen to Paul's music, um, Paul has a way of taking you on a ride, like, uh, and you have to go on the ride with him, and you have to use a word that I love talking about Paul's music. You have to zen it, and it's, it's like riding a, a wave. Uh, if you fight that wave, you will fall off that surfboard every single time. You have to give yourself up to what he is he is taking you along with. And there is a beautiful piece in uh, Christmas in Maine called Joy to the World. And he starts you on that wave. Uh, and it, it's just like Butterfly's Day Out uh, with <laughs> Edgar Myers, you know, when they get you on that rhythm. And you have to ride that rhythm. And just when you're just cresting a little bit, he does something unexpected. And he brings in the melody of Joy to the World. and. It, the only word that I can think of when you listen to this piece is satisfying. And as a composer and as a musician and as a pianist, when I first heard that, there's a line in, in Waiting to Exhale where the woman just says, and I exhaled. When wow. I first heard that piece, that's what I did. Oh, I exhaled. That's great, because Aaron. in Thank in, you. in Butterfly's Tale, the you. same thing happens. Yo Yo Ma comes up with that cello. Yeah underneath and, and we're going to listen to this piece right now. Uh, listen to what Paul does. He, he tricks your ear into thinking that you're hearing something that you're actually not and then as you're riding that surfboard and you're riding that wave then he brings in the melody. So this is Joy to the World from well, Christmas in May. One, one way I, tr I hadn't thought about that but w you can listen for this. The, I suppose the trick, I wasn't aware of it until you pointed it out but the very first thing you hear, the piano goes and go tell it on the mountain. No, 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 that's oh. joy to the world. Yeah. Joy to the right. Da, 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 yeah. da, da. So anyway, I, that's it. Kind of gets it into your mind there. Yeah, and then there's a, a wonderful little thing that made me literally laugh out loud. LOL, <laughs> is that when Paul when Paul does dee dun dun da 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 dun 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 bum bum bum. Now, if anybody has ever sung "Joy," uh, go tell it on the right. mountain. That little dun dun dun. I literally laughed right. out loud because as a over the hills and far away. away. Yeah, right, I, yeah, because right, right. I had just done Black Nativity and I said, <laughs> oh, "There's Paul in yeah. there." So let's listen to this.
ません。<笑>はい。Uh, I don't know what year it is, but maybe it's One Life to <laughs> Live. Yes, I think you made a guest appearance oh, on One Life to Live. This is scary. So why don't you tell us about how you got on to One Life to Live? Was there a pianist in One Life to Live or what? I feel like I'm being... Uh... This is Jin, by the way. He's packing it down pretty hard tonight. But no, how did you get like on I'm One being, Life? Uh, how, how did you get on One Life to Live? Interviewed for my uh, <laughs> Supreme Court justice here. Uh, Were you on One Life to Live? <laughs> I was. I was. Um, um, they cast strictly on looks, you know? They, <laughs> it was all about that. They saw me walking down the street. Now, I, how I ended up on there, I don't really remember what the connection was, but I was, I was cast and I had a little role for maybe a month uh, where I was a, a jazz band leader. Oh. And I had a little band, although it wasn't a band I knew. I, they, you know, they, again, they put together some good-looking guys. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wasn't as bad-looking at the time. Uh, but anyway, it was, you know, we, I don't know what in the world. I had never watched the show, obviously. And, and, uh, but I just, you know, they said, all right, you guys, this is a jazz club. You know, when Tony comes over, you say, you're not looking so good tonight, or, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> and... Uh, So it was fun. Everybody was very cool, totally professional. I do remember, you know, the, because I was only 22 or three, so it was all, whoa, what do you yeah. do now? Oh, is that how you do that? Right. You know, I thought that was supposed to be a real waterfall. Oh, you know, that kind of stuff. I was, but yes, one life to live. I did do it. I don't know how long, I said for maybe a month. Right. Might have been a lot longer than that. Right. I, I certainly wasn't like, A character that people cried when I went off the show. I was a bit player. Did they kill you off? I don't, I don't think so. I think my agent, <laughs> who I didn't have, no, I. Uh, Did she get killed off? It by was a all very shot? vague. I was not an important part of the production, but I did have my, you know, I did have my little one line things like, you know, want us to play that one again, Joe? Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that kind of thing. That's it. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a monumental year in the world of music, and um, for all that's being disclosed about him uh, in the music field, we, we've known many of the stories anyway, but for all that's being written, uh, this might be a loaded question, but uh, how did you end up in Leonard Bernstein's living room? Well, uh, that's quite a question, but... Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Well, of, and first of all, I'm sure there are a lot there, of people it, with a lot of answers. First to that. of all, uh, there were three three locations. He had a home in Connecticut. He had a home at the Dakota, and he had a, a, a studio. Um, he had a co-op. Uh, which which one? This was, was it? at the Dakota. The Dakota. Yeah, okay. his apartment. And uh, I uh, I was and am friends with his daughter Jamie, who just wrote uh, a book, a memoir about her father, and. Uh, Through her, I met him, but he—he he really was—he uh, was a real musician's musician. He liked musicians. He—he—he he, he did not try to keep a distance. He did not try to exempt himself. Or I mean, he had to because of his tremendous celebrity. But he, like, I remember uh, one night doing Nine, the musical. 
we all had a, the, the, the orchestra played a, a little post balloon going out music as the audience left the hall. And uh, when we finished, it was normally just silence. And we finished it one night, and there was the sound of one person clapping. And it approached the pit, and we looked up, and there was Lenny. <laughs> and I say Lenny not to brag about any kind. I wasn't a close friend of his, but that was definitely who he was. You know, he was Lenny. He knew a lot of the guys in the band. He would not have left without thanking us, and you know, and just that's the way he was. So. Uh, I got to know him <clears throat> just through various musical circles, and then he had this party, and he invited me to come, and I walked into, well, <clears throat> he, it began that evening earlier with a concert that he conducted with the, the New York Philharmonic, and that was an incredible experience. I was sitting in a box seat right up near the stage, and Lenny gets out there, and <clears throat> this is at you know, Lincoln Center. And he was so far beyond having to prove anything to anyone. He was Leonard Bernstein. That's all you needed to say. And the orchestra just worshipped this guy, and the audience worshipped him. And so the, by not having to prove anything, this is what I mean, he, <clears throat> he had his stick, and he had a podium, and he was conducting a Shostakovich symphony, this, massive, just rambling, uh, expansive universe of, of a symphony, incredibly complex. And he wasn't using the score. And he, he got out there, he takes his bows, and they all start going, and he's conducting like this. And after about five minutes, he, he just put the stick down, and he, uh, he, well, I'll show you. He, he, here's the orchestra all playing. And he started walking around the stage like this. And he took his glasses out. And he, he's on stage like this. <laughs> and they're just furiously making music. And then he'd go, he'd go, and, and he'd you know, do something to the violins. And, and uh, then he'd just kind of go like this for a while. And then it, it, you know point to the French horns. And you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, it, it was like a guy. Um, conducting a stereo on a Sunday afternoon in his living room. <laughs> he was so just absorbed in the music, and he just made us feel like we were all in his living room. It was spectacular. Then, we, then I did go to his living room, and I walked in with Jill to his, we came in actually through the kitchen of the apartment. I don't know why we went in that door, but we did. And I walk in, and there's Lenny, and Midori, and Isaac Stern, <laughs> and us. I mean, and it was a night like that. And I went over, and they, you know, welcomed me. And in his living room was a quartet from the Metropolitan Opera just singing. And uh, it was a night that you just couldn't believe. Uh, Betty Comden and Adolph Green sitting next to me at the piano. I was, I was. At one point, this was cool, I was, I was sitting, it turned into a music hall, people played. And uh, I, I, w I t was not playing the piano at this point, and I stood behind Lenny, he was in a wing chair like this, and the rest of the living room was there, and, and the other performers were here, so this was sort of the stage area, and he was alone in his chair, he wasn't with any other people. And Joshua Bell was playing the violin, and he was a kid, and Midori was a kid, and Joshua Bell was playing Irish reels. And they were these kind of weedly, chromatic, it wasn't good time stomping, it was like just chromatic, wheedling, and I don't, I mean that just in that it was complex tapestry. And Lenny's sitting here, and I'm standing right behind him, and he didn't know I was there, and he's got his ever-present cigarette. And so he didn't know that anyone, he was not speaking to anyone. But 
all through the, through the, the Irish music lane. He's there, mysterious. <laughs> so, so mysterious. So mysterious. He just kept saying, so mysterious. <laughs> And it was, and it yeah. was the perfect word. And I, I kind of like, you know, rode on his shoulders. As, as like, yeah, it is. It's incredibly <laughs> mysterious. And here's, here's, he's just playing these, these little comps. Mysterious. <laughs> and then he, I was back at the piano, and he said, uh, let, let us all dance the waltz. Oh, here we go. And he looks at me, play a waltz. So I started playing da da di da yum dum dum so he leads off the dancing and he's all around the floor and then the next thing you know everyone's out on the floor so then you come to that part da da di da da di dum bum ba da di dum bum ba dum ba and i knew that if you were doing it in a concert version you'd play you'd Retard, that is pause. Da da dee, ba bum ba, ba ba ba, da ba da da ba da ba. But I thought, and I, I really did think all of this through, because, you know, this was like <laughs> the big time. I wanted to do it right. They're all out there dancing, and I said, okay, well, I guess when you're dancing it, you can't do that retard. You, I, I think you probably just have to keep the beat going. So I just did it. I went da da dee, da 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 dee, da da ba da ba, and then I started the next verse. Well, got to that same place again, and all of a sudden this face comes roaring out of the crowd. It's Lenny, and he goes, "Retard, retard!" <laughs> and I just about stopped playing. I mean, it was so intense. So I. I learned that you always <laughs> retard when people are dancing. <laughs> ba da dee, ba ba ba. I mean, I really. Or if you're in Leonard Bernstein's living room. Yeah, right. you do what he says. But he really did it, just like very <laughs> unmistakable. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, in 2009, you began composing uh, what would become your first choral work, even though way back when you were introduced to choral music in the fifth grade. Right. You didn't start until 2009. And you began composing what would become your first choral work entitled River, commissioned by the Bagadoose Chorale. Bagadoose Chorale. Of to celebrate its 35th anniversary about the life and work of its founder, Mary Cheney Gould. Mm -hmm. it, inspired, it was inspired by two things. Mary's life here in Maine. She lived on the Bagadoose River. And two, which is, I think, marvelous. It's saying yes to life. That's, that's what we were talking about. Right, saying yes to life. Saying yes to it all. Uh, Bagadoose River has reversing falls. Does your music? Wow. Uh, because I say this because there's a piece of music called Galaxy that yeah. you wrote, uh, which I think has a lot of reversing in it. Uh, and I've studied it uh, from beginning to end, and, and I would like if we could take down the, the, the uh, lights. It. We're going to listen to Galaxy. This is a piece um, you wrote in 2000. Uh, when did you write uh, this? I think it was 2012. 2012, and we'll talk about it. But let's let's I listen ask to this. You. This is a piece you know much uh, more about that it Paul that. wrote um, <clears throat> uh, called Galaxy.
Gorgeous. Oh, that was so cool. Gorgeous. Sarah. Great the way you did that. Thank you. Fabulous. <clears throat> Thank you. you know, one thing that, one thing that um, you know, when I hear something like that, um, there was once, a, uh, this is about you, but I'm going to tie it in with, with a story about myself. There was a reviewer that just reviewed a, a, an album that, of mine that came out in the 90s, 90, I don't remember what year, but it was the early, early 90s. Um, and it, they acquired it to a, another composer. Um, and said that it was reminiscent of that composer. And I wrote the review and I said, thank you very much you know, for that, that um, comparison, uh, but the composer that you have joined me to uh, was two years old when I released that. <laughs> so you need to get your, you know. And, and throughout my, my <laughs> career, you know, uh, my music or my playing has always been you know, when I released an organ CD, they said, well, you're the next blah, 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 or your playing is very blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, when I hear that gorgeous choral music and someone might say, well, that sounds a lot like uh, whoever, or um, listens to your piano music and, and might say, well, you know, that's very reminiscent of something else. Do you ever get tired of comparisons as a composer or a <clears throat> pianist, or are you happy with with your out your body of work standing alone as it is. Yeah, I. <clears throat> no, I don't. I don't. I don't get tired of it. It's, it's. Everyone's perception is you know, unique and and. Uh, yeah, it's not. <clears throat> if someone were to say you know you. No, I, I don't. Because that's a brilliant. That is a brilliant piece of choral writing. Well, thank absolutely you very much. brilliant. Thank you. And you know, there there are people. Oh well, you know, the biggest choral writer right now is Eric Whitaker. Right. And that gorgeous build up from the bottom, where that chord just comes together and <laughs> disharmony into harmony. You know, and and people say, oh, there's Eric Whitaker in that. No, that's Paul Sullivan. You that know. is because I really don't know Whitaker's work exactly too much. right. But you I know, know who he is, and I have heard somebody. Exactly right. I actually learned more about him at that place where I wrote that. It, right, which was the uh, a workshop. Composer's workshop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I, I wonder. Yeah, no. I, I uh, the the only composer, the only musician who I owe so much to that I often will say so at concerts is Art Tatum. Art, because. Yeah. You know, he didn't write any of his own pieces, so he doesn't get composer credit. Mm -hmm. But, but when I play jazz, really all I'm ever saying is, "Help me, Art." <laughs> you know, I just revere him so, and I have copied, you know, stolen endless things from him, either directly or the the very the style. I mean, that's how you learn, mm. and I make no bones about it. And I, but I certainly don't want any audience, you know, I've never recorded any of that mm. because the world doesn't need Paul Sullivan trying to sound like Art Tatum, you right. know, and it, it doesn't. It's not as though you'd ever mistake the two. And I've got my own, you know, sullivan -ish, ish that comes into it. But he's the, he's the one guy I would say, and maybe Chopin. Chopin, I've never directly cribbed things from, but he's so in my soul mm. that, I mean, somebody once said I called me the Irish Chopin. Chopin, <laughs> yeah. Well, as I said to you earlier, uh, on a, uh, when we were talking on the phone, I said, you know, I lived by Horowitz uh, when he went to visit, um, when his mother brought him to Scriabin at nine. Scriabin said to his mother, yes, he'll be a great pianist, but make sure that he is a well-rounded person. In other words, he needs to be educated in all aspects of life. And it seems like you are well-rounded in all aspects, just like Lenny was. He was a composer, he was a conductor, he was an author, he was all of those things. But on his passport, he put one word, musician. Yeah. And it seems like that for you. Because when I asked you for your musical heroes, you put down Art Tatum, you put down Glenn Gould, you put down the pianist uh, Levin. Yes, you that. put down Stevie Wonder. Those are so eclectic right. in the world of music. Uh, right. And you have to have all of those if you're going to be right. all of those things that They're you are. They're all having a party 
right now in my head. Exactly. Right. right. And I would, and if we were at a party, I would rather sit down to, with someone like you and have a conversation than with someone who is just horse blind into one career uh, that only talks about one specific thing uh, that they've studied their whole life. I would rather be able to hold court with you talking about Art Tatum and then switch over to uh, the opening of Titanic of Murray Eston right, right. and to be able to, to keep right. on for two hours. Uh, we cannot keep on for two hours, so I'm going to I think to, we already have for six hours. Yeah, who could, we're be, gonna close, who could be interested in all this? We're going to close before we go into the question and answer um, with what I close with all of these, and this comes from uh, Proust and also James Lipton, which is the questionnaire. These are just very quick. All right. Ten questions. Lightning round. Wow. Okay. What is your favorite key or and or chord? Uh, I have s several chords, but they only exist in the context of a piece. I mean, I'm thinking of this Mahler Fourth Symphony. It's a G major chord. So I guess you could say that because but it's just a, it's the setting, it's the context of the chord, and when it finally comes, you just melt, but it's just a chord. There's no chord that, if I sat down on the piano, I'd say, oh, that's, that's my chord. It's gotta have... It, do you play in a certain key when you sit down and you start playing, do you always um, go to that key? No, no, I don't. I, I, uh, no, I, I really don't. I, I've got songs in all keys. Was Bach like the sharps? Of course, they were in different uh, HZ, but uh, Chopin loved flats, D flat. Yeah, e flat. I, I guess, I, yeah, I, okay. Uh, flat keys generally have a little more melancholy. Okay, so now, and, we're, uh, now we're getting to it. Uh, because, because <laughs> I knew it would get it out of me. Because you love nature so much, what's your favorite season? Autumn. Uh, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, that's a simple question. Uh, uh, connection. Connection with people, connection with the cosmos. Yeah. What turns you off? Uh, human comparisons and snobbery. Mm. If you could have played with any musician, living or dead, who would it be and why? Stevie Wonder would be right up there. Yeah. For obvious reasons, I think. Uh, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Okay. What is your favorite sound? My favorite sound is silence. It's because it's got infinite possibility mm. and profound Serenity. What is your least favorite sound? My least favorite sound, I think, is the word goodbye. Mm. Okay. What profession other than your own would you <clears throat> like to attempt? Well, I can't, I don't have enough imagination to even think of what else I could do, but it would be some sort of social work. Serving people. Mm -hmm. How or for what would you like to be remembered? Uh, I would like to be remembered for having been a good guy, a good husband, a good dad. <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, you didn't have to do all that worrying. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, this is the moment we're going to bring up the house lights, and you have the opportunity to ask Paul a question if you would like. Just raise your hand and shout it out. Yes, sir. I'd like to know who oh, Leon is. In well, thank you. Uh, Leon was a, uh, a farmer, uh, an old... Uh, an old guy who embodied humility, simplicity, kindness, and deep connection to his world. And story alert, but I did 
I'll tell you privately after, if you're interested, I saw, after he died, we saw the ghost of Leon. Mm. Thank you. Any others? Yes. When did you lose your Boston accent? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, I never lost it on purpose, and, but it seems to have been sort of high school years. Uh, but I used to, remember Zaire department stores? Mm. One summer I had a, this is proof that I'm from Boston, I had a job in a Zaire, and I worked in the fabric department because my girlfriend's father owned the fabric department. And he gave me this job. And I used to have to go on the, the intercom like two or three times a day in the back room and make this little speech. <clears throat> and it went as follows. <laughs> Good afternoon, Zia shoppers, and welcome to Fabulous Zia's, <laughs> where you can sew and save every day in our fashion fabric department. This afternoon, we're offering a very special extra value. Summer Shear, regularly 99 cents a yard, has been marked down to 77 cents a yard for final clearance. That's Summer Shear, now 77 cents a yard, in the fashion fabric department located in the right rear of the store. Thank you very much, shoppers. So that, <laughs> that is my passport, <laughs> that I'm from Dorchester. <laughs> Any others? Yes. We saw a wonderful show that you did years ago at the Strand Theater where there was uh, an, art, an artist's picture behind you and then you came up with music that went with whatever you felt that particular painting showed. Have you done that again? Was, was, he, was the artist there and drawing it? Because I've done that too. No, this was just a... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, I, but uh, I'm glad you saw that. And I, I still, uh, on my list of things I really want to do is art and music. In, yeah, I, I won't go into it, but that's very near and dear to my heart. And, I, and that was an attempt at it. Yeah, boy, thanks for reminding me. This is, a, this is unbelievable. I had no idea that this was my life. Yes. Eggamog and Reach was the very first song on my very first CD in eight, 1987. I remember you being here at Rome Top yeah. in the afternoon, and you were painting a rosy picture. You were playing. Yeah. Uh, wife was sitting there in front of the fireplace with the babe in her arms. Oh, yeah, that was the... Uh, just so rosy. And all of a sudden, it turned gray <laughs> because you said the baby had color. Yeah. Uh, that was, yeah, that was the, the Cradle song. I wrote it for his lullaby, and he absolutely hated it. And, uh, yeah, and then he would scream and scream and scream, and then I wrote this thing, you know, in my naive dad moment, saying, oh, that'll be perfect, I'll play this piece. And so one night he was screaming, and uh, I sat down to play it, like, waiting for the magic uh, dust, and he, it was like gasoline on a bonfire. He hated it scream the louder and uh, I <laughs> had to stop and go over and, and it turned out that uh, what comforted him was the sound of a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and, and it always did and uh, though it would probably be arrested for it now, Jill and I would sometimes sit and read the paper with the, the Hoover on <laughs> and, and he'd be just great. He'd, you know, but turn it off and he did not want to hear about no music, I can tell you that, no sir. Yes. This is, this is apocryphal. There's a legend about you, Paul. Uh oh. Oh. This is an old dear friend, by the way. <laughs> Full disclosure. Well, you don't have to answer this question, okay? It is musical. So the, the, um, the legend is that uh, you were practicing for, uh, you were assigned um, that uh, the uh, Bach, a Bach invention to learn to, to be played Yeah, exactly. Is that true? Well, 
it's based on true. I mean, what, what, as I recall, and believe me, just take that for what it's worth, but I, it, was, it was in one of Klaus Goetz's recital things there, and I, I was playing a Bach fugue, and I lost it in the middle, and just went on my own, and finished it off. I went rogue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I got away with it, and only those who knew that what had happened knew what had happened. But, you know, most people thought, oh, that's... But the music teachers all just said, you have got to be kidding me. I can't believe you got away with that. Yeah. Yeah. That did happen. I do remember that. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Yes. Great. Oh, yeah. One of the things we've noticed, and while it's not universally true, is that many of the students which do this to the point where they might have the chance of being professionals, uh, about 80% of those that might achieve that level start out very young in their dance or music, whether it's guitar or piano or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was from, from birth. Dancing? <laughs> Is that what he asked? <laughs> I started very late, uh, late teens. Yeah, that is interesting. Stein something. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, I really. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that story. Any others? If not, uh, I would like to thank you all for coming this evening. This has been a complete, you're still here. complete joy. Uh, this, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending this evening. Uh, there will wow. be a moment, however, where uh, what's the matter? I'm you want to tell going? you, and I'm certainly not going to tell you. Uh, there is an opportunity now where you can come up onto the stage. I'm going to leave now. Where Paul will uh, greet you. You can take a picture with him. He's brought CDs go. for you to buy and sign if you would like to. Um, otherwise, our next uh, talk will be with Dr. Richard Nickerson, who uh, started the Wyndham uh, Chamber Singers and has won a Grammy for Teacher of the Year, and that will be next month. Thank you all for coming this Wait. evening. Oh, I just want to say truly a sincere thank you. I am, I am kind of blown away that you would sit here and listen to this much of me just telling stories. I, I thank you deeply. I can't really believe that you did, so thanks. Mm -hmm. So come up if you'd like to talk with Paul, get a, a picture with him and, and buy a CD and have him sign it. Thank you.